Hi, good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm uh, Harold Holzer. I have the honor of serving as director of Roosevelt House. And on behalf of uh, Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, um, whom we celebrated last night uh, with the Hunter College Foundation, I'm sure most of you know we now are about uh, 13 working days and counting uh, before Jennifer retires and leaves us. So we're, and I hope that those of you who have not seen the exhibit upstairs on the restoration and repurposing of Roosevelt House and her extraordinary contribution to that, we'll have a look when we go upstairs for our reception. Anyway, it's a pleasure to greet you at another of our Roosevelt themed programs um, and on what seemed to me when I read the book is a neglected topic, a history making event that took place four score years ago. So as you can imagine, I have a natural fondness for it. Um, and in quite an exotic place. And speaking of exotic uh, things I might mention, I'm very uh, happy to welcome a very special guest to this evening's program the great Judy Collins, who is here. <laughs> and the wonderful um, designer of the Korean War Memorial, Judy's husband, Louis Nelson. <laughs> um, we all are blessed to be having an event like this in a home that FDR lived in for 25 years, right up to the moment he left for Washington for the presidency. Um, his mother who built the house died in 1941 and FDR decided he could no longer bear to be here without mama. So he sold the house to Hunter College, happily for us. And um, while we are here to discuss a World War II summit that took place in January 1943, uh, later that same year, so it's also 80 years ago, uh, there was another secret summit meeting in Tehran, and it took place at the time that FDR was scheduled to turn over the deed to Roosevelt House publicly to Hunter College. Um, it was it, our special guest and I will be discussing the secret nature of these summit meetings as opposed to the public pomp of summit meetings and press coverage today. But anyway, um, Eleanor showed up, not a bad substitute, to deliver the deed to the president of Hunter College. Where was FDR? Nobody said he's indisposed. Well, he was on a battleship on the USS Iowa en route across the Atlantic to Africa, and he almost died on this voyage because submarines who were accompanying him decided, well, decided, someone else decided, but they put on a show of torpedoes. So they let off all these dummy torpedoes to show how brilliantly they traveled across the waves. And there was a, a cry, live torpedo, live torpedo. Someone, an American submarine directed a live torpedo at the Iowa. And the FDR heard the cry and he said to his valet, push me over to the starboard side, I want to see it. <laughs> he was a Navy guy. and it actually hit a breaker, you know, a wave, and exploded well before the ship. And the person who dispatched it was court-martialed. But Roosevelt commuted his prison sentence. Just the end of our story. <laughs> anyway, um, we are going to discuss tonight the plan that won the war, as um, my friend um, Jim describes it. If you think the re recent debt ceiling crisis and negotiation was fraught, wait until you hear the story um, of the devils will get no rest. So our special guest, I at last get to it, is a friend and prize-winning colleague from the Lincoln world who, um, like me, has come to the other side, and, but he now in a published book uh, and is now uh, writing about World War II. James Conroy was a one-time aide to a New York member of Congress, which is another bond between us. Um, uh, 
it's a, I, he worked for Jim Shoyer, I worked for Bella Abzug, and um, he went on to practice law there. Our paths certainly diverged. But he wrote some wonderful books about Lincoln. He won the Lincoln Prize in 2017. And um, unlike me, he decided he'd had enough and has moved on to this other field. His new book combines uh, diplomatic history, military history, crafted, I think, in a novelistic, at times cinematic style that will have readers sitting on the edge of their seats, even if we all know how World War II ended. There are moments when it might have gone a different way and the Allies might not have been united in common purpose. And I, this book riveted me because it has the drama. Uh, even if we know the ending, we can imagine ourselves not knowing the ending. Um, so our plan today is that Jim and I will have a conversation um, I'll stop talking, I promise, followed by a reception and book signing upstairs in the Four Freedoms Room. And this is one book you will definitely want to add to your Roosevelt and World War II library. So now, please join me in welcoming James Conroy. Uh, this is publication date. I hadn't realized that, so congratulations. And I also forgot that this is actually our second appearance that we did one of your other books here. So the last time you came down, it was the day you told me that Trump was elected president. The day after, yeah. And, and today is the day Trump uh, was uh, you know, fingerprinted or whatever. Um, anyway, Jim, you didn't know about this. This is my first surprise for you. Um, we're going to start with a little film clip that I, I'm sure our audience will recognize, um, probably seen a dozen times. Without knowing, I'm not being too cutesy here because it applies to our story. So when in doubt, start with Humphrey Bogart. So, Danny. <laughs> but but I show that for or for a reason. And Jim, you you explain why is the movie, um, why does the movie play an actual part in in your book? Well, first of all, I shouldn't mention that uh, my Swedish mother was a cousin of Ingrid Bergman, so I oh. won't mention it. Be still my heart. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, Roosevelt uh, and Churchill and the rest of the high command uh, came to Casablanca in intense secrecy. Uh, the German Air Force had bombed Casablanca two weeks before the conference began and were well within range of doing it again had they known who was there. Uh, so it was all very top secret, but the uh, evening before, or I guess a day or so before he left uh, for this arduous journey, which was a five-leg journey in those days, uh, he had a dinner party at the White House, he and Eleanor, and a uh, small party, and had a private showing of a movie, which was Casablanca, uh, as, a, as a joke that wouldn't be appreciated for a few weeks to come. <laughs> Is that amazing? And it what hadn't been released, right? It, it, was, had, right? it was just had it just been released, just by coincidence, yeah. Anyway, that's my excuse to show a Bogart <laughs> clip. It really plays a role. Um, so here's the here's the book cover. Um, the Allies were meeting, as you as you write, to discuss agreeing on a strategy for, for winning the war, right? To choose a landing spot for what would be an invasion in the southern, southern part of Europe. Um, whose idea was it to meet? I mean, it's not easy for FDR to travel at that point, right? No, not at all. And uh, apart from the mere difficulty of being 61 in a wheelchair and not in the best of physical shape, uh, it was, as I said, a five-leg journey in those days, uh, partly by train and then four air flights across the ocean and through the Caribbean. And uh, much of that, the latter end of it, was patrolled by German submarines and real, real live yeah. torpedoes uh, and uh, aircraft as well. So it was a very dangerous situation uh, to be in. It was FDR's idea. Uh, they had, uh, the Allies had been taking it on the chin for three years, barely holding on uh, to short of abject defeat, uh, had lost every battle uh, in Europe other than the Battle of Britain, which was defensive, no offensive victories at all. 
And uh, just within the last few weeks before the conference, the tide had begun to turn. Uh, the British Army had defeated Rommel uh, in the Egyptian desert and began pushing him west uh, into Libya. And the uh, Americans landed directly from Hampton Roads, Virginia, uh, <laughs> appeared off the coast of Casablanca when the fog lifted, much to the surprise of the defending uh, French, actually. It's a longer story, but it was part of the French uh, uh, Empire, and um, they um, they met in Casablanca because it was sort of a centrally located place for the British and the Americans, and because all the major Allied generals and admirals were in the vicinity. So, but Churchill wanted another location. You're right, right? Yeah, Churchill loved Marrakech, uh, had painted <laughs> had painted in Marrakech in the 30s, and uh, recommended it highly. And uh, the British planners who set up the, the location. Uh, sent a young uh, officer over uh, to scout out potential venues, and uh, he learned that Marrakech was, in fact, a delightful place and that Churchill would love to go there, uh, so he didn't even visit it so as, quote, not to give him a loophole, close <laughs> quote, uh, because he would have been there in a minute if he, uh, if he had, if he had so, the, the power. So why is, why is Stalin absent from this meeting? Stalin was otherwise engaged in the middle of the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, which was going on at that very time. And uh, in fact, the, the Russians surrounded the German army there on the last day of the conference, and uh, that too helped uh, turn the tide. So the basic mission was, OK, now we're no longer in a defensive crouch. We're no longer just hanging on by our eyelids, as a British, German, uh, British officer said. Uh, we can now begin to go on the offensive. And the question is where and when and how. So Casablanca is newly secured, right, as a city or secure enough? Occupied, but not immune from attack. Yeah. So what were the, secu the security precautions? If anyone watched the, uh, the Trump motorcade today, hmm. there must have been a 1,000 personnel attached to it and on the streets, yeah. a lot of money spent. What was the security precautionary, uh, the, the, the squad there? Sure. Well, uh, it was Patton uh, whose army had taken uh, Morocco a few weeks earlier. Uh, and uh, Patton was therefore in charge of uh, the lodgings and the entertainment and the rest uh, I've always said he's an unlikely cruise director, but uh, <laughs> that was the role in which Patton was put. And um, uh, th what he had done is commandeer a resort hotel uh, overlooking the sea uh, on the outskirts of Casablanca called the Anfa Hotel. And around it were 14 or 15 very luxurious villas owned by wealthy Moroccans and Europeans. I'm showing this one. Yeah, that's, the, uh, that's uh, FDR's villa. Uh, uh, in the shadow of the hotel. Uh, Patton commandeered all the villas, too, for good measure. And uh, they put a mile of barbed wire around the whole affair. Uh, British Marines, American elite troops, tanks, anti-aircraft guns, fighter planes circling overhead. So that was the security. Was there any, did, did, there was no, I mean, if you see the movie Casablanca, it's filled with spies and Vichy yeah. actors. Word never got out that the, that the two leaders of the Allies were in Casablanca? Well, this may be the choice story of the book. Uh, everybody tells me it is anyway. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the word, uh, obviously, people knew something was going on there. There's, there's something important was happening, but they didn't know what. There were all kinds of rumors that the Pope had come with Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, and all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> but uh, nobody thought of the absurd idea that Churchill and FDR and their entire high command would be sitting in one place for 10 days within range of the Luftwaffe. So that was not a heavy rumor. Uh, but what had happened was uh, a spy uh, for the Germans in the Spanish uh, station of the, uh, of the uh, German spy network had gotten wind that uh, Churchill and FDR were meeting in Casablanca and sent a dispatch to Berlin that said exactly that. And some poor German officer translated Casablanca as White House. Uh. <laughs> uh, 
uh, what became of him, I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what, uh, that would have, the outcome would have been quite different had the translator been more astute. Just one question about the personal dynamics, because you write um, chapter after chapter over uh, that deal with that deal with who's hosting a dinner, who's coming to the dinner, who's the host, who's the guest, who's the leader of the free world. What would? How did Ro I mean, they all had code names, right? Um, who who do you feel was in charge? I mean, who was the preeminent figure at Casablanca? And you know what you have to say, but you don't know what you have to say. <laughs> well, Churchill could never be considered, it never never did well in the second lead. You know, it was not a good place for Churchill to be. But basically, he was the second lead. I think FDR yeah. was the dominant character uh, on the political side. On the military side, uh, the British were uh, far more sophisticated, far more experienced. Uh, 300 years of imperial military uh, systems and management and, uh, you know, white papers and all the rest. The Americans had been in isolation for 20 odd years and uh, utterly unprepared and came to Casablanca with three loose leaf binders, uh, one of which was who they might see uh, and, and who they might meet. Uh, and the other two were odds and ends. The British came with a headquarters ship uh, filled from stern to stern with uh, every white paper and every you know, war record and any, any sort of expert you can imagine. The British came with 72 officers uh, to this meeting. The Americans came with nine. But as you point out, the, the British and American arrangement committee agreed that the, that, the, that the negotiators would not be staffed. The British just decided, that's all right, we'll do it anyway. FDR wanted to come with the smallest possible staff. Uh, he trusted his own judgment. He didn't like leaks. Uh, he wasn't unless, unless he was doing the leaking. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, that's always a, another angle. Uh, and he wanted to come with a very small number. Uh, Churchill uh, telegrammed back and said he needed this and that and the other thing, and say around 50. <laughs> uh, and it turned out to be 70, 70 odd, so. Yeah. So let me show these maps that you were good enough to share because A, they have to decide on the next stage of the war, which will be an offensive war. And B, as you, as you write, um, the Americans want to preserve their prerogative to attack in the Pacific where their war had, had started. So what do, the, what do the British want and what do the Americans want that was Difference, different in terms of landing and landing spots and timing. Yeah, well, there were a dozen significant issues that they had to hash out. But the two, first of all, this is a terrifying visual here, if you think about it. Uh, this is what the state of the world was in January of 1943. Uh, the Germans are uh, and the Italians are in black. Uh, everything else in dark green is occupied or allied with the. Uh, the, uh, the Germans, and the lighter gray uh, are uh, nominally neutral countries, but in fact all sympathetic to the Germans and supplying them with steel and weapons and all kinds of things. So Europe was almost completely dominated by uh, Hitler's Europe and uh, Nazi Germany, I should say. And on the Asian side, you can see that the Japanese had basically taken control of everything within their wingspan. And, uh, you know, they had taken the French Indo Indochina from the French, and uh, Malaya and Hong Kong and Singapore from the British, and uh, everything else they could get their hands on. So it was really uh, an overwhelmingly uh, uh, favorable situation for the Axis uh, forces. And uh, so the, the two big issues then were. Uh, apart from some lesser ones. Uh, one, uh, what pr proportion of our resources are we going to devote to the Pacific and what proportion to Europe? Uh, the uh, British were very much in favor of a minimal war in the Pacific, the very least that was necessary to contain the Japanese. And the Americans wanted to go full bore at the Japanese. And uh, in Europe, the essential uh, debate was between the American uh, desire to cross the channel and hit the Germans in the teeth as quickly as possible, uh, whereas the uh, British, 
who had been to France recently and had left in a hurry in 1940 right. uh, and knew what they were up against far more than the Americans did, uh, were uh, very much in favor of going up through the Mediterranean. And the way uh, the British described it, uh, General Brooke, who I'm, we'll get to, uh, the, the head of the British delegation, uh, said, if you look at the map of Europe and imagine fingers coming down into the Mediterranean from a hand, uh, first of all, the Mediterranean was closed to Allied shipping because the Axis controlled it. And that required all the shipping to go around uh, Africa rather than through the Suez Canal, which was a huge liability. Uh, and secondly, uh, the, the British were rightly convinced that if forces were massed on the North African coast that were obviously getting ready for an invasion, the Germans would not know where it was coming whether it was coming in Italy or Sardinia or Sicily or Greece, and they would therefore have to disperse their resources and their forces, not know where they'd be hit, and there was a vulnerability there that they could handle. Whereas if they had crossed the channel in 1943, the British were convinced, and I'm, I'm convinced as well, that it would have been a catastrophe, that they probably would have lost the war. So that was the big, the big debate. So let's take a look at some of the military leaders who were engaged, I guess there were daily sessions with the naval and, uh, and army commanders, and then Roosevelt and Churchill got engaged at dinner over drinks, over FDR's typically late breakfast. Tell us something about, it wasn't, from the way you describe it, they weren't fun meetings. They were really tough, and you you... You portray Marshall as trying to negotiate patiently, Admiral King as being really in a foul temper, uh, and, and the Brits really being in control of the of the proceedings. Yeah, well, let me, if I may introduce uh, the room here <laughs> to start with. Uh, actually, quite quite a bit out of the picture there, but Admiral King is the uh, chief of naval operations of the, um, the United States Navy. You see his stripes on yeah. his sleeve. Yeah, a lot of them. Uh, he was, uh, he's to the left there. Uh, next to him is Marshall speaking, uh, George C. Marshall, who's more famous today for the Marshall Plan after the war, but was the chief of staff of the United States Army at the time, a formidable figure. Uh, Dean Acheson, uh, Truman's Secretary of State, uh, who was no shrinking violet himself, uh, described, uh, described Marshall's very presence as a striking and communicated force. Uh, when he walked into a room, he took command of it. That's the sort of personality he had. Next to him, to his left, is uh, General Henry Arnold, known as Hap Arnold, who was the head of the American Air Forces, uh, who had uh, a drop dead line if anybody questioned his uh, aviation uh, credentials. The, the Wright brothers had taught him to fly. <laughs> uh, uh, next to him, uh, is the American note taker, a brigadier general who is a note taker, uh, and next to him, the British note taker. And I got to tell you, if I may, Harold, uh, one quick one. Um, Vivian Dykes is the British note taker there, uh, uh, who is uh, in the secretariat of the British military, the guys who kept the paper going and the minutes and all of that, which was very important. And um, not only did they sit through all the meetings, but they had to produce the minutes overnight. Uh, so there's a poem that accompanies that, just a couple of lines. Uh, and so when the great ones repair to their dinner, the secretary stays getting thinner and thinner, <laughs> racking his brain to record and report what he thinks they will think they ought to have thought. <laughs> uh, next to him is a, is a German-speaking American, General Wedemeyer, who was also very pro-German, which was not fashionable at the time, uh, had been an exchange student at the Berlin Military Academy. Um, obviously, uh, you know, not unpatriotic, obviously wanted to win the war, but um, saw the Germans as a bulwark against communism, which to him was a far bigger threat than Nazism was. Uh, to his left, sorry, did you say something, Harold? No, no, oh. I'm, watch, I'm, I'm watching the people on our oh, monitor okay. here. To his left is General Pug Ismay, as he was called, who was very close to Churchill, uh, although not a member of the actual uh, command uh, staff, 
to his left is uh, Lord Lewis Mountbatten, who is probably known to most of you, who is the uh, head of British commandos and combined operations, a cousin of the king, and a grandson of Queen Victoria, great grandson, I guess. Uh, next to him is the, uh, the leader of the British Navy, the first sea lord, uh, uh, Dudley Pound, uh, who was said to fear neither God nor man nor Winston Churchill. <laughs> Uh, next to him is Alan Brooke, who is the star of the show, in my opinion. He was the chief of the Imperial General Staff, uh, the son of an Anglo-Irish baronet uh, from a family that had produced generals for uh, 300 years, uh, generation after generation. Uh, and then finally, next to him is the chief of the RAF, uh, whose name was, uh, uh, why am I blanking, Portal. Uh, uh, Sir Charles Portal, who was the uh, commander of the RAF at the tender year, age of 49 years old, uh, a brilliant, uh, a brilliant guy. So we were. That's the group. And and for those who think this may be daunting, uh, Jim provides a cast of characters, a dramatis personae, and so people can go back and and check on these folks and their origins and their predilections. But there are other characters who come and go in the book. Um, um, Montgomery, uh, Harold Macmillan, right? Yep. And um, Averill Harriman. Averill Harriman. Eisenhower. Ike. Oh, yeah, Ike. Um, you, your, your Eisenhower is not um, the, uh, the stalwart, cool headed leader of D Day. He's like, f there are mishaps surrounding him all the time. Yeah, Eisenhower, which was new to me uh, until I dug into the research, was really more of a political general than a military general. Uh, he uh, was very good at uh, managing people, very good at uh, blending the British and American staff uh, that reported to him. Uh, everybody liked Dyke, uh, and uh, really was, that was his forte, his expertise. And really. he had never faced an enemy in battle up to that point, right? In, in World War I or World War II. Right. Yeah, it's really uh, And uh, his military strategic uh, capabilities were minimal, to tell you the truth. The people who reported to him, you know, did that, and he did the politics pretty much. But uh, Brooke, uh, at, the, at one of these meetings, Eisenhower presented a plan to take a port uh, in Tunisia from uh, the Germans, and Brooke there, sitting on the British side, just took him apart. I mean, just exposed his amateurism, and uh, I mean, not in a rude way, but in a humiliating way. Uh, so uh, it's really a role reversal. The Brits were by far the, the dominant uh, yeah. power and the dominant uh, figures in this meeting. We'll see how that holds in the movie version. But <laughs> So then an occasional plenary session, right? And yeah. here we see FDR and Churchill. What did, what did they add? I'm sure they're briefed every night by their negotiators, right? And then... Churchill thinks he's winning the day, and FDR knows that he will have the final word. Well, yeah, well, uh, FDR and Churchill, while the military guys were, were meeting and negotiating, were having their own meetings and having their own you know, political discussions and military as well. Churchill was vastly more uh, in-depth on military issues than FDR was. Uh, uh, Churchill went to Sandhurst, the West Point uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, had to, you know, a veteran of three wars, had written 24 books of military history, was really steeped in military strategy. FDR was not in his league as far as military strategy goes, but the expert politician, as you know, and the natural politician who used that charm and instinct to work his will uh, when he could. So yeah, what happened was there were two plenary meetings, this is one of them, uh, in FDR's dining room at what they called the Moroccan White House. Uh, and uh, uh, they, would, they would not bless what the military chiefs had done, they would debate what the military chiefs had done. So there would be two or three hours of really hard give and take between Churchill and FDR and the military um, nobody giving quarter to anybody else by rank or civilian or military status. And uh, those meetings were quite interesting. Was Marshall as um, blunt with FDR as he had been in that famous early White House meeting when he told him what he did not want to hear when he was first taking command? Yeah, uh, Marshall uh, said a, a number of things along those lines. Uh, my favorite of which is, um, Never got too close to Roosevelt, 
made a point of never laughing at his jokes. <laughs> right. So uh, Marshall was not about to be cowed by anybody, including the President of the United States. And uh, FDR leaned on Marshall, really, for his military advice. What I found most enthralling and as this account continues through, it's, you, and you do it day by day uh, in the book, is how Roosevelt can get through it all. I mean, he stays in bed for long periods of time and works from bed, as he did in the White House. But Churchill, and he dined almost every night, right? And then the drinking begins. And, right. and Churchill drank a lot in Casablanca. And Roosevelt Only in Casablanca, from what I understand. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but, I mean, how did he keep up? Just being charming and inscrutable throughout. FDR? FDR. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you another little telling detail. Uh, Churchill called Roosevelt Mr. President. Uh, Roosevelt called Churchill Winston, uh, just to let him know who had the whip hand. And the thing is that the British, again, not only were more sophisticated and more experienced, they had vastly more military resources in Europe uh, than the Americans did. Not a single American bullet had been fired in Europe on January, in January of 1943 and not a single American bomb had fallen on Germany. This had all fallen on the backs of the British with tremendous American help, but everybody knew that there was a huge American army gonna be coming and, and tremendous industrial capacity and all the rest, but that was gonna take a couple of years, uh, or a year at least, to build up. So at the moment, the British had all of that going for them. Now a good novelistic history has to be awash in subplots, and um, my favorite subplot of the book is um, the competition between Giro and de Gaulle. I mean, Roosevelt wants the French, the free French, to be represented. This is French Africa. And this handshake was hard to get. To tell us, I mean, de Gaulle is the, is the character that we remember most because he emerged as the political leader. But tell us about the desire to get them there, and poor Churchill, he had the, he had, he was tasked to make it happen, right? It's about, a, I'd say, a quarter of the book, so I'm gonna have to make it a real synopsis, but the essence of it is, and, and I don't think many of us know this or are aware of it, really, but, uh, you know, the French had been conquered by the Germans in less than a month, and the armistice uh, terms uh, included German occupation of the entire northern part of France and the entire Atlantic coast. Uh, what was left was was under the leadership of a nominally independent French government uh, based in Vichy, a little resort town in the middle of France, which was really now a German puppet. Um, the uh, North Africa running, well, we don't, we don't see the map anymore, but North Africa running from Morocco uh, to Libya uh, was under French control. And the Americans and the British hoped that when they landed there, that the French would just welcome them and join them, uh, because you know they had no love for the Germans, needless to say. Uh, but they, in fact, resisted uh, under the orders of the Vichy government. Uh, 3,000 men were killed in a couple of days, about equal numbers on both sides. So we fought the French uh, in a serious way in, in, that, uh, in that span. But long story short, uh, the French did eventually roll over effectively and join the, the Allies in North Africa. Uh, so that all said, uh, de Gaulle had escaped from France cinematically in a small private plane, uh, got a BBC microphone from Churchill, and became the voice of the French resistance in France, a, a tremendous national hero in France. Giro, the other general there, was mainstream French army, uh, not political in the least, but basically a Vichy uh, general. So uh, Giro was the American man, de Gaulle was the English man, although Churchill wrestled with him just about every day. Uh, and the trick FDR is doing uh, was to get them to publicly shake hands, at least, which they did at the end of the press conference, uh, this is the famous photograph. And if you look carefully, you'll see they're standing as far from each other as the <laughs> laws of physics allowed. Um, but they did do it, um, and um, Churchill, <laughs> after this uh, handshake, 
uh, one of the Americans uh, asked uh, Churchill about uh, de Gaulle, you know, what were, how were things going with de Gaulle? And uh, Churchill said, oh, let's not talk of de Gaulle. Uh, we call him Joan of Arc, and we're looking for some bishops to burn him. <laughs> <laughs> but de Gaulle didn't want to come, right? Not right. De Gaulle was, it was beneath de Gaulle's dignity to come, uh, and certainly not on French soil that's occupied by American and English troops, but was essentially threatened by Churchill right. that if he didn't come, uh, they would just have to do their best without him and decide who's going to lead France uh, the next time. So he came. So the other subplot that I was fascinated by is you have Churchill, who has dreams of restoring the empire, the French protectorate, or whatever one calls it, in North Africa, and Roosevelt, who's got a deeply anti-colonialist streak in him, who and, and this wonderful uh, photograph represents a... Uh, the visit of the Sultan of Morocco, who FDR kind of liked and encouraged, right? I can see Churchill glowering at him here. <laughs> so there, there is that streak. Is that, would you like to expound on Yeah, well, basically, uh, FDR was the embodiment of anti-colonial uh, uh, philosophy, and Churchill was the em embodiment of imperial conservative philosophy. So uh, at least it tells you something that right and left can, in fact, get together and shake hands and eat together occasionally. But um, the essence of this was that uh, FDR invited the Sultan to dinner at his Moroccan White House. Uh, and, and he came with his son, who was standing behind him, by the way, uh, who was a great admirer of Patton, by the way, and uh, told Patton that when he became Sultan, uh, Patton would be his grand vizier, uh, and we will go everywhere in a tank. Um, but in any event, uh, Churchill sat to the left of the Sultan and FDR to the right, and FDR just filled the Sultan's ear with thoughts about how after the war, the Americans would come in and help his people uh, learn the technical uh, skills and such that they needed to be independent and to have their own economy and not have all the wealth sucked out by the British Empire. <laughs> uh, Churchill's biting on his cigar throughout, throughout this whole thing. And um, it, was, uh, it was an interesting evening. Uh, one other thing I should say is that the dinner was uh, dry because of the Sultan's Muslim faith. And uh, Churchill writes a diary entry, uh, dinner tonight with the Sultan, dry alas. Um, afterward, recovery from the effects of the same. <laughs> <laughs> um. Other characters there. I, was, I had not realized that two of Roosevelt's sons, and I guess Randolph Churchill mm -hmm. also filtered in and out. The, everyone seemed to like um, FDR Jr. and Elliot and dislike Randolph. Yeah, what Randolph, that? the British disliked Randolph. I think dislike is the mildest term you could use. He was just an arrogant, pompous, impossible uh, guy. Uh, one of the junior British officers wrote that um, Randolph uh, showed up unexpectedly and uh, spent the rest of the time with us as a sort of fungus uh, <laughs> that uh, distracted his father from what he should be doing and bloviating to everyone. So Randolph and, and was not popular. FDR Jr. and Elliot were in the service, but they would, would, did FDR know they were coming? Uh, he did. I'm, I tell the truth, well, I can't recall if them, he knew. Knew that one of them was coming and Elliot uh, well, surprised him, something like that. Yeah, Elliot was. Um, in the, uh, in the air wing uh, as a photographic reconnaissance pilot, and uh, Franklin Jr. was in the Navy and had actually been decorated in the battle at Casablanca. Um, and he knew they were in the vicinity, uh, and uh, he didn't do it, but Hop Harry Hopkins arranged to have them come. Yeah, I want to yeah. I wanna also, I mean, it's, it's fascinating that I think Rose, uh, from your descriptions, Roosevelt really was buoyed by the, b his sons being there, yeah. invited them to dinners, included them in things that maybe you know, he shouldn't have included them in. But we're used to that now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, this is not at Casablanca. At least they had security clearances, though. So, yeah. Right. Let's talk a little bit about Hopkins, who you see here, how important he had become. He sort of replaced Louis Howe as Roosevelt's confidant. And, of course, Louis Howe lived in this house when the Roosevelts were here in the, in the 20s and 30s, just helping Roosevelt with his recovery from polio, his comeback, but Hopkins is in the role now. 
Yeah, Harry Hopkins. Not uh, a well person, right? Like not, Louis Howe. Far well. from well, yeah. Harry Hopkins was uh, the son of an Iowa harness maker who went to uh, Grinnell College in Iowa, which was a Christian college with very social justice oriented mission. Came here to New York and worked in, in the slums as a social worker and uh, became involved in FDR's administration as governor of New York. Um, FDR spotted his talent. He was a brilliant guy and could get things done better than anyone else. And uh, he became really FDR's alter ego uh, during his presidency and came with him to Casablanca as well. And your question was? He was, was he was at every meeting, right? He was, uh, he was at the, F, the FDR and Churchill meetings, right? Yeah. He was not the military, in the military meetings. So yet another side story, because this is 10 days. This was an extraordinary episode to me, and that is Roosevelt's determination to take a long and bumpy car trip to visit and review the troops. And Jim paints this extraordinary portrait of troops that are lined up to be reviewed by a VIP unknown to them, although they, with guns facing the troops, right? They, the security people aimed guns, and who is riding by but the commander in chief? Yeah. Why was he so determined, and how how big a an effort was it to do it? It was quite an effort. He when he arrived, he demanded to go to the front, you know, where the where the Germans were actually engaging the Americans in Tunisia. And they said, no, you're not going to do that, but uh, we can arrange an inspection of troops who are not in combat but are on their way. And uh, so uh, uh, FDR was, was driven out in a little motorcade to where the troops were, a couple of hours away, uh, uh, northeast of Casablanca. And they were all lined up for an inspection, which they thought was going to be uh, conducted by General Mark Clark, who was one of the major American generals. And uh, suddenly FDR is rolling down uh, the street in a Jeep, as you can see in this picture. Uh, they were stunned, delighted, amazed, uh, incredible morale boost uh, for them. Uh, Averill Harriman actually writes a very moving description of that. And uh, to me, the most moving thing really was uh, uh, Patton. Some of you may be surprised that Patton was a bit cynical. Um, <laughs> But Patton thought of this as a political exercise, was kind of angry about it, that FDR was sort of trying to gain political points by doing this. It was far from that. And the proof of that, I spent several days at the FDR library in Hyde Park. And there are letters that FDR had caused to be written to the parents and wives, uh, sisters, brothers, whatever, of the soldiers he had uh, worked with, who had driven him or had guarded him or prepared his food or whatever, and also had photographs taken of the military cemetery uh, in Morocco where the uh, dead were buried, and uh, had all of that sent to these, these family members. Uh, the letters that came back, I, I have a hard time even reading them, frankly, that, aloud because they're just so moving. But um, they range from uh, you know a family in Wisconsin saying, we, we're the happiest people on earth that are our son, just a country boy, you know, got to uh, serve the president of the United States. Uh, there's a young wives writing about how worried, you know, that they they had been and how relieved they were to hear that the president had seen uh, their husbands. And uh, some of the parents wrote back moving letters about their sons being, you know, in a hollowed cemetery, as one said, uh, rather than in some unmarked grave. So it was really quite moving. And the final side trip that interested me was, as you said, um, Churchill loved Marrakesh, and he decided he really wanted FDR to see it. So tell us about that. Yeah, the, uh, Marshall uh, knew that this was in the wind because he'd been told by his insiders in the British uh, delegation, one of whom was very close to Marshall and had been was stationed still in Washington and came with Marshall mm -hmm. to the conference that Churchill was going to insist on taking FDR to Marrakech. Problem was that there was one regiment of American troops in Marrakech and three divisions of French troops there who had fought the Americans weeks earlier. And the place was crawling with German spies. So Marshall said, no way. But FDR was the commander in chief, and Marshall wasn't, so they went. 
uh, and uh, they spent uh, a, a day and, and a night uh, in a beautiful uh, mansion in Marrakech uh, that was lived in by the American consul there. But tell us about the visit to the tower. Yeah, uh, the, the, the mansion had a minaret uh, that you had to go around a winding staircase to get up several stories high. And Churchill insisted on bringing uh, FDR up there. So he had to be carried by two Secret Service agents and kind of joked all the way up about his horses bringing him up. But uh, Churchill got the sense that it was a little embarrassing for him to have to have his disability uh, stressed that way. But they got to the top of the tower and spent an hour or so watching the sunset. There's a very moving picture, actually, of the two of them up there. And what did Roosevelt extract in return for that effort? I'm not sure what you mean. There. Oh, OK, yeah. Uh, actually, it wasn't a deal. But uh, when Roosevelt went home, uh, Churchill went back up into the tower and painted that, that view uh, from the tower. He's really quite a talented amateur painter. Uh, he used to call it a joyride in a paint box. Um, and he hadn't painted at all since Hitler invaded Poland. But he just loved this scene and painted that. Uh, it wound up in the hands of Angelina Jolie who got it from uh, Brad Pitt. And after they were divorced, Angelina thought better of, of keeping it and uh, handed it over to Christie's, which sold it for $11.5 million. But it was in Roosevelt's possession for a while. It was, yeah. How it got from FDR to Brad Pitt, we'll leave for another <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Another Churchill event. sent it to Roosevelt as a gift. Uh, and I don't know how it got to Brad I don't Pitt. Know. No. I can't imagine. But no. So again, this, this conference has proceeded in secret. But then at some point, and we're gonna, in a minute, we'll see the clip, Gaumont News, the British news agency, gets some clips and suddenly this event is announced to the world. So let's look at it as, as we, it, contemporaries would have seen it in movie theaters. <laughs> From these pleasant surroundings, which have become the behind-the-lines scene of a major war theater, the latest of the surprise meetings of Mr. Churchill and President Roosevelt was announced. After this conference, there were many groups to be filmed and photographed in the garden. Beside the Premier and the President, you will recognize Admiral King and General Marshall, Admiral of the Fleet Sir Dudley Pound, Air Chief Marshal Sir Charles Portal and General Sir Alan Brooke, Field Marshal Sir John Dill, and Vice Admiral Lord Louis Manbatten. If the historians of tomorrow come and dig up the garden, they'll probably find a buried hatchet. So, in the end, um, oh, uh, I should just, this is, FDR's specialty is at press conferences, right? So in the end, it is this cluster of journalists as FDR spins it and Churchill spins this result and it's public. Um, so how did the plan they crafted ultimately win the war or begin to win the war? That's the crux of it. Well, again, to do a three sentence synopsis of a 18 page document, <laughs> uh, the essence of the deal was that um, the Americans would have a free hand in the Pacific, but only with the forces that were already there. So they couldn't get any more ships or planes or men, but what they had was theirs to do with as they chose to do, which they did very, very well. And uh, as we all know, and rolled back that map we had up there of uh, Japanese domination. The other half of the deal, the major half, was that um, uh, the Americans agreed not that they would not cross the channel in 1943, uh, essentially because Marshall became convinced that it was not practicable, it just wasn't doable. And if they had tried, it would have been foolish. And he could see that and was man enough to back down and agree that uh, what they would do would be to build up a tremendous invasion force in England uh, for a year and then invade across the channel in the spring of 1944, which is what they did. Uh, so. Uh, the, the, the third part of that is that they would attack first in the Mediterranean, specifically Sicily, and that was a big debate as well, whether they should take Sicily or Sardinia you know, during the, the conference. But the agreement was to go for Sicily, which they did, 
uh, the following June and uh, did take Sicily. And uh, Sicily is two miles from the boot of Italy, which sort of suggested itself as the next uh, target. And they began to fight their way up the Italian boot. Um, the, the weight of military, and I am no military expert, but the weight of military expert opinion is that they probably fought too long in Italy, that uh, once they had gotten to Rome, they should have stopped because the rest was just too heavily defended and wasn't all that strategically important. But of course, they did cross the channel in 44, uh, and we know what happened uh, as a result of that. So, so if nothing else, this conference, aside from bringing these leaders together in a pivotal area, um, just to find the strategy that worked and had American leadership prevailed without the amelioration of the conference, they might have invaded Normandy precipitously. So it did change the war. It did, and, and it's a model, I think, for what we should be doing in this country today. Uh, the cultural differences between the Brits and the Americans in 1943 were just as significant as they are between Oklahoma and New York today. Um, really, I, I won't get into it, but a lot of heavy cultural differences, a lot of economic differences, political differences, and yet they were able, with nothing less than the fate of the world at stake, uh, to sit in this place for 10 days and, and work out a deal and, and come to know each other, eat with each other, drink with each other, and um, these suspicions and anxieties and you know mutual hostilities kind of melted away and uh, they were able to do that deal. If they can do that, we can, we can get over what we need to get over, it seems to me. Jim, thank you for talking to us. We have time for a few questions before we get upstairs. So we have a mic, so please wait for it so the Zoom attendees can hear. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the fact is that, as you say, um, when the conference began, not one American bomb had fell, fallen on Germany. But in January of 1943, the first American bombs did fall on Germany during the next step in the daylight precision bombing campaign. And I believe that's what the title refers to, which is that Ira Eker, the head of the US 8th Air Force, was able to convince um, Churchill because of the idea of round the clock bombing. Can you talk sure. a little bit about that? Sure. In a nutshell, again, the British were bombing German cities by night um, and because they didn't have the uh, precision, the ability to precisely bomb factories or dams and that sort of thing. The Americans did have that technology. They had a very sophisticated bomb site and their planes were built for daylight bombing. So the Americans were bombing precision in France and Holland at the time, occupied France and Holland, uh, and the Germans by night in the cities. Churchill wanted the Americans to stop bombing in the daytime and join the British at night. And Ira Eaker, who is a son of a Texas sharecropper, uh, the general in charge of the 8th Air Force in Britain, uh, sat with Churchill at Casablanca and convinced him that if you let us keep bombing by day, we're going to start as soon as this conference is over, as you say. They did start after that. Um, and you can keep bombing them at night, and we'll keep them up around the clock. They won't be, get it, you know, any rest. They won't know, you know how to marshal their forces. We'll overwhelm them. And Churchill said, kind of nods and bites on the cigar and says, I like it. The devils will get no rest. So that's where that comes from. I should have asked that question. Thank you for <laughs> where the title came from. Anyone, anyone else? Well, let's go upstairs and have a glass of wine and buy the book. <laughs> <laughs>